Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. He's a complicated man, but no one understands him but his woman. My Shaft? name is Eric, and I'm not Shaft. I'm oh. Eric. Uh, my name is Eric. I'm here with Michael, uh-huh. and we're talking about Shaft today on Double Feature. Yeah, we are. But we're also talking about another film. Yeah, we're going to talk about Enter the Dragon. So it's time once again, I suppose, uh-huh. to revisit uh, genres we were once uncomfortable with. Kung Pao Fried Chicken, we're going to call this. Oh, God. <laughs> too much racism too early in the show. Sorry. We're actually going to do Shaft first. Uh-huh. Uh, so I guess you might as well get that shit out in the intro. Mm-hmm. I think I have a filter on Logic to just cut the racism out, so none of this will probably oh, even great. make air. You need a chauvinism filter. So normally, you know, spoiler warning and what have you. Uh, maybe spoilers for Shaft? Yeah. I don't know about a whole lot of spoilers for Enter the Dragon. Yeah, what, I don't What know do you think? If, I don't think that Enter the Dragon is really spoilable. I think the enjoyment from the film comes from mostly beating people up. And I want to actually encourage people to talk about, we have uh, what I'm pretty sure is going to wind up being a new double feature piece of terminology today. Oh, yeah. Uh, when we talk about Enter the Dragon. So I think you're okay to listen to that part. If you haven't seen Shaft, I don't know, see that shit first. So if you want to skip over that, you haven't seen it yet, use the chapters. There's chapters embedded in the actual feed of the show. So if you listen to it on a iPod or some such, you can skip over to the next movie. And if you don't listen to it on that, there's stuff in the lyric section so you can figure out where the fuck you're going. Those are called timestamps. All right. So in talking about Shaft, a couple things surprised me mm-hmm. about the movie Shaft. Um, one is, so we're back in the seventies now. Yes, we are. Okay. 1971. And we have, um, I'm a little bit surprised. I'm watching this and I'm thinking gotta be 16 millimeter yeah gotta be 16 <laughs> millimeter it's grainy as fuck all the and people look looks, really dark yeah so it's actually shot in 35 millimeter although it is mono yeah and oh my god we've is never it? really talked about this but i think every dvd you own is in mono yeah so since i've been and and i i guess this is a really good time to address this but when we first started the show my dvd collection was heavily 80s with the slasher stuff and a lot of the 2k movies were all on dvd but since the advent of double feature into my life everything i own is from 1970 i don't know how that happened because i'm not a big 70s guy yeah i don't know it's not me where all that shit's coming from i I don't know where it came from but so yeah all my dvds are now in mono well let's look at that year we're talking 1971 right Mm -hmm. so it's the same year as clockwork orange came out in the mainstream we're kind of doing the uh, you know, the duck you sucker stuff more prominently, I guess, dirty Harry or get Carter, um, around this time, horror is doing Willard, the original, Willard. the remake of which we covered on the show. Um, sci-fi has got Omega man. And then the road exploitation is just, I mean, it's doing vanishing point mm-hmm. and it's doing two lane blacktop. Yeah. Same year. Um, another one we probably need another one. We probably don't need to cover on the but show, will. but should at some point certainly will. So there's the infamous Shaft trailer that's... Uh, I don't know if you've ever seen the trailers for the Shaft movies. I don't think I have. They're exploitation as fuck. They're, uh, it's just a combination of scenes from the movie with voiceover. I know that sounds like every okay. trailer, but I mean, there's no it more thought... does it thought. start with in a world? There's no more thought put into it than that. There isn't even in a world. Okay. It's just... It almost seems to be random scenes from the movie pulled out, and then someone is just doing some... Hyping the movie up? Yeah, that's it. That's all it is. And the first trailer ends with uh, Ask Your Mama, if you can see Shaft. Okay. <laughs> and then the second movie, uh, the second movie's trailer says, um, Ask Your Mama again. <laughs> wow. And then they get to Africa and no one gives a shit anymore. So Ask Your Yo Ma is the third one. <laughs> I have nothing to say about that. So the guy who was doing all the artsy shit was busy on the actual movie Shaft and mm-hmm. clearly not on the trailer. And, you know, there are some surprising shots where you can tell people, I mean, sometimes we watch exploitation and no one loves their job. Mm-hmm. Everyone hates that shit. Yeah. And sometimes we watch exploitation and it looks like these guys got a chance. Right. And they fucking tried their heart out. Uh, you know, that scene where Shaft first gets back to the little private eye office uh-huh. and he's fighting those guys and you have, you know, the first person fight moves, right. which are so unnecessary. Sure. Well, there. I think that a lot of that is, you know, 
to not have to pay a stunt man to get hit. Okay, if sure. If you punch at the camera, no one's getting hit. You're only paying your actors. You don't need a stunt man until somebody gets thrown out a window. So you're convinced this is all just straight down to the budget? Well, I, I, that's just where my brain goes. Is why would you do that? That looks really, really lame. But then there's stuff out, you know, in that very same scene you have uh, where the guy's woozy from being punched. Yeah, and you know things are shifting back out of focus. There's just little bits of that sprinkled throughout the uh-huh. movie. The icon of the movie, the guy, the that titular remember, character, yeah, is Shaft. Yeah. Not to be confused with Richard Roundtree. Yeah, I don't know who Richard Roundtree is. He's like Shaft's alternate persona. Right. The one no one talks about. Uh huh. Richard Roundtree plays Shaft. Right. Not just in the movie Shaft, but only in his career. Yeah. I'm pretty really. sure that's about about all. Uh, I remember Richard Roundtree as Shaft, but you're convinced that you forget who that is the second yeah. the movie for is For me, done. when the movie ends, for me, Shaft is always Fred Williamson. I don't know why. Why is that? I don't know. I feel because Fred Williamson to me is bigger and he's got a lot more attitude as a human being. And so that translates better to Shaft because Richard Roundtree as a human being seems like a super nice guy. Mm -hmm. And I, I, it's really difficult for me to place him as As Shaft. The bad mother, shut your mouth. Well, you know what helps a little bit is the fucking turtleneck. Yeah, that's true. This is the weirdest get up in, you know, the thing that's weird. Okay. So. Shaft wears a turtleneck, mm-hmm. which he tucks in, by the sure. way, because that's just what you do with your turtleneck, right? I guess. And then he's strapped with his Saturday Night Special. Yeah, so he's got uh, he's got that kind of side holster on, which almost looks like suspenders. Uh huh. And over that is, I think it's supposed to be a brown leather trench coat, right? But it looks like it's made out of some sort of plastic mm-hmm. material. So what you're saying is, we kind of instead of Shaft, we have more of a cool Urkel image. That's exactly what I'm saying. And it's not even so much just how bizarre that is, but the fact no one even seems to notice yeah, it. Yeah, well, it's weird because Shaft as a as a character in the film is always 100% John Shaft. Yeah. He never pretends to be another person. He mm-hmm. never, as a private eye, he never goes undercover, right? Yeah. He, the example... Well, the bartender. Right. I guess you're right. But he, but but he he's never... he's not really undercover Once he s- introduces himself, he introduces himself as John Shaft. Right. And the thing that that I always note is he knocks on the door when there's a group of underhanded criminals with Malcolm X on the wall. Yeah. And they ask, who's there? And he says, it's Shaft. <laughs> right. And, and instead of, you know, instead of... There's no ruse there. Right. And, and the criminals in a, in a normal real life scenario, it's the police would be like, oh, scatter, man. We got the fuzz. But instead, right. they're like, open the door. It's Shaft. <laughs> yeah, he got us. <laughs> well, and it's funny, too, because you know it's only one guy. Yeah. It's just Shaft. Mm-hmm. And you always get this impression that maybe he's cool with the criminals. Right. But clearly, that's not the case. Sure. He's, he's not really cool with anyone except no. the ladies. So he's always Shaft. And Shaft is a PI. He's a private investigator, which is such a weird job. Yeah. You know, it's uh, it's very cinematic because it's outside the law. It's a little bit of the vigilante thing, uh, but he's not quite a cop. He's got some sort of badge or something. He's got some sort of relationship with the police or I think something. I think there's a weird, a weird kind of he used to be a beat cop thing. Something like that. Because I going think on the the dude that ends up helping him out at the end was his ex partner in some in some capacity. He could have been he could have been a <laughs> criminal war. even. Yeah, there's a dynamic there that's not uh, explored too much. Although the film comes back around to it mm-hmm. every once in a while, especially during the super awkward ending. I love how he laughs at his own jokes. Yeah. And by love, I mean hate how he laughs at his own jokes. It's just so weird. He'll make a joke and then immediately start laughing. Well, you can just tell it's screen directions. I was just right? going to say, yeah, it's in the script. In the script, Chef delivers X line and and then in parentheses, laughs. Yeah, and he Richard, might as well say, yeah. <laughs> close it yourself, shitty laughs and walks away. Right. Well, it, it's kind of like when we did Black Dynamite with Hero, which this show is a nice homage to, mm-hmm. uh, where the character in Black Dynamite says... Uh, sarcastically i'm in charge or right i have a family shows picture yeah (laughs) yeah there is so much black dynamite in this film we didn't talk about shaft a whole lot on that show but it's uh, whether it's this one or the the shaft film that follows this uh it pulls really heavily from Mm -hmm. the it's a it's almost a complete parody of shaft itself an incredibly well done one and one that brings a, a lot of its own creative elements to it but it is shaft we're talking about you know what strikes me as really odd about the Shaft character is that he's black and poor? Yeah. How does that work? Well, I think, okay, so that's clearly, 
that's the racial gravity comment. Right. There, every once in a while, you get a racial gravity comment in a black exploitation film, sure. which goes to say that we're not exploiting black people. They're the downtrodden, and we're bringing them up. Yeah, they're the underdogs. But Shaft is getting paid fifty dollars an hour plus expenses to pick his nose and go around <laughs> and find some guy's daughter, which he clearly has no problem doing. Yeah, it's he gets n- shot once. It's not an issue for him, though. I mean, it's not like this is the hardest PI job he's right. ever had. Not at all. But the thing that I like is that he does, he gets brought down. He gets shot. Sure, he's not invincible. And Exactly. And I really like that dynamic of the film is that even though maybe even in his own mind, he's untouchable. You can't, you can't fluster him he's always got the upper hand in conversations even mm-hmm. but he takes a bullet it's weird though that money thing that he complains about being right. poor. i mean so 50 bucks an hour mm-hmm. he's uh some quick math here what's he working for like a week in this movie that's like twenty eight hundred dollars yeah so we're talking about especially by today's standards he's making at least thirty thousand dollars maybe closer to fifty thousand yeah. dollars just hunting down this girl which by the way i'm not even really sure why they need shaft to do it it it's seems because, like any private detective could well, have handled this. The the again the there's the the bumpy character who uh-huh. is the the guy that cries, right? right. The crying, the super heavy <laughs> character in the film. Right. He shows up and he needs John Shaft because Bumpy's a criminal. Shaft is outside the law but still involved with the law. Ah, there and it is. he's black. Which means that if if the race war that the whole film is kind of telling us is about it's an imminent tanks on broadway man exactly (laughs) a race war between the italian jews and the black hoods shaft is is going to be on the right side in this particular case it's strange that the movie kind of starts building a race war thing yeah and then just ignores it yeah there's kind of this weird as if to um, tell you this is what the stakes are right and please remember that because we're not going to talk about it for the rest it's a it's a weird detroit 9000 premise that gets swept under the carpet really quick once shaft kind of gets rolling and is a charismatic anti-cop i guess the legacy of this movie is one that's really long lasting i mean it was uh incredibly successful yeah not even just for what it was but by i guess any measurable standard sure well it even got an oscar got an oscar for the music work right (laughs) right it was the uh, the Isaac Hayes stuff. Well, that's kind of an interesting note as well, because this is some of Isaac Hayes' best-known work oh, for sure. a soundtrack. Sure. You, know, you don't South see Park. that very often. Yeah, that's even more bizarre. So his most well-known work might be for a soundtrack or for music he did jokingly for uh-huh. a cartoon. But it is really good, yeah. especially that opening scene. It, it, no, they the, build the whole first 10 minutes of the, sure. the movie. It's just a really long, it's the Shaft theme song. Uh-huh. And just Shaft walking around. Yeah, and it's Nothing's not going even, on. it's not an establishing thing of Shaft is a badass. It's more like Shaft walks around New York. Yeah, it doesn't even tell you too much about the where he lives or the neighborhood. Or the or, time of year. He's just walking around. That's yep. all it is. But the Isaac Hayes song is so good, uh, despite its poor grammar, that you don't even give a shit. You're yep. just, okay, that's fine. Shaft theme song. This is what we need right now. And there are other songs that kind of pop up in the film, and mm-hmm. they're just as enjoyable. Yeah, I mean, he did a lot of the instrumental work, too. I mean, really, all the memorable stuff we're talking about here is the Isaac Hayes songs. And I think that's probably one of my favorite parts of the movie. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's definitely deserving of the Goldie Baldy. It's unfortunate that the theme song is the first thing in the movie, because yeah. it's always kind of downhill from there for me. I just want to hear the theme again. Until they do the the awkward heist at the yeah, end. Yeah, which I always forget about, and for you is apparently what the film is all about. Well, the film's a couple things. Uh-huh. The first thing it is is noir pretending to be black exploitation. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Because we're not dealing with the usual black exploitation elements. Not even close. Uh, and the second thing is the heist at the end. Yeah. Where they just kind of break in, and then he makes an awkward phone call at the end. Peace out, movie's over. Yeah. And then you get the, the signature shaft... We didn't have any time to put into this font on the end credits, uh-huh. which As continues he walks through away the, into the night. But we're not dealing with the kind of exploitation that uh, Black Dynamite at its heart was right. making sure. fun of. Not even close. Or when we're talking about something like uh, The Great Coffee mm-hmm. or Foxy Brown. I it, should say The Great Foxy Brown because I love that one. It's really odd for me that Shaft is the iconic black exploitation mm-hmm. film when, of all the black exploitation films I've seen, Shaft is possibly the least black exploitation but sure. maybe that's why it's the one that everybody sees because it's the most approachable it's mm-hmm. the least strange and obscure 
something like Cleopatra Jones is not going <laughs> right, to be right. the the go to for the valiant black exploitation effort of our you know decade. Yeah, you know it's just like we talked about with Smokey and the Bandit a couple mm-hmm. weeks back about how that was one of the most successful uh, things that could maybe be considered for sure. exploitation. But in you know even in saying that now I look back on it and say was that road exploitation? It's successful. It's a successful piece of exploitation because it's very loosely sure. exploitation. It's the most approachable. That's why these movies are what they are. That's why they have a cult status. That's why it's a smaller audience that even knows about exploitation because they're not for whatever their uh, their genetic film makeup is. They're not blockbuster movies. Mm-hmm. And so when you see the blockbuster examples of exploitation, they're not always the best representations of the genre because they did something different that allowed them to garner mainstream success. Right. And here, that thing that's different is just being the long goodbye or being Chinatown. Sure. You know, As these, opposed to Sweet Sweetback, which came out the same year. Oddly, some sort of influence to Shaft. Mm-hmm. But by taking that stuff out of the detective genre, the, the pulp genre, it managed to attract a bunch of critics, and then by being good, I suppose, it yeah. managed to attract the critical praise, and thusly the, the name it has now. Mm-hmm. But before we get too overwhelmed with mainstream success, can I just bring this back into obscurity for Absolutely. a little bit? Absolutely. That's my favorite thing to do. Drew Bundini Brown. Okay. So Drew plays, what is it in this movie, Willie? Willie, who should stop playing with himself. I keep remembering. Yeah, and they make a joke about it, too. Oh, awful. Uh, I keep remembering back to his other iconic moments, like people that he played in other movies. Uh huh. You'll never see this guy everywhere. This isn't a name you need to know. But in order to to talk about obscurity a little bit here, uh-huh. always something I remember from Shaft is this man's hair. Yeah, and he's in Shaft's big score as well. He's kind of the the character that comes back for the next movie to make it feel like it's really a piece of the franchise. Although it's clearly just one odd actor mm-hmm. that they didn't kill off in the prior movie. Right. So he's like a big deal in the next movie. But he has this fucking reverse mohawk. Yeah. It's totally unintentional. Yeah. It's just the bald spot. Sure. But it's, uh, you ever see the, the David Lynch movie Dune? Nope. Of course not. Why did I ask you that? It's a really odd movie. And part of the sci-fi element is, you know, this reverse mohawk hairstyle. Um, Cher's son, Elijah Blue Allman, had a reverse mohawk for a while. Look up the reverse mohawk on Google Images. It's probably one of the worst haircuts of all time. And this man accidentally was born with one. I feel bad for him. So we have not only the sequels, but a sort of remake thing yeah. that happened. Um, there's Shaft's big score right. after this, and Shaft in Africa. Uh-huh. Now, what's really weird about the Shaft trilogy is that's the first time the word Shaft trilogy were ever uttered in the history of humanity. Have you ever heard of the Shaft trilogy? Not really, no. No, of course not. Nobody knows that. You've probably heard of Shaft in Africa, I though. Yeah, I have heard of Shaft in Africa. Yeah, so people know about Shaft. They know about Shaft in Africa. No one is aware that there is actually another movie called Shaft's Big Score. Which is the one in between. Yeah, right. It's the second one. So it doesn't just go from Shaft and then Shaft comes back and now he's in Africa. There's a whole fucking movie in there that nobody even knows about. Mm-hmm. I don't know why no one knows about. I don't know what the deal with it. It's the same director, too. I don't know if there's a strange distribution thing there. You know, a movie that got so much critical acclaim, no one has any idea. It's still Richard Roundtree. It's, it's possible still Shaft. that people just think it's the same movie. That might be what it is. Shaft's big score continues a trend that we didn't talk about yet, but it's uh, it's James Bond. Yeah. It's, um, you know, this came out the same year as, uh, what was it, Diamonds Are Forever? I think it's the seventh James I've Bond I've seen movie. like four James Bond movies. That is totally okay that you've seen four James Bond movies. I'd like to officially go on record before year eight of double feature where we have to do all the fucking bond movies i hate the bond movies i think they're chauvinistic i think they're simple i think they're base repetitious and they do barely anything interesting for the 29 hours of your life you need it it's probably more than 29 oh yeah absolutely probably something like 30 i'm Mm -hmm. just making up numbers now that you have to dedicate to a hell of a lot there you go that's a totally appropriate opinion you know who did like the bond movies is the people who made shaft you don't see it a lot in the first one but the second one especially, there's this Gadgets. casino kind of scene, and it's more the the Goldfinger kind of stuff, um, the painting bodies, and there's a whole body paint weird scene in this. It's actually pretty cool. Uh-huh. But uh, by the third one, they're actually making James Bond references in the okay. movie. He gets gadgets. I mean, the whole thing is really, especially for a movie set in Africa. Yeah. Um, really, really You really, bizarre. if you want to have gadgets in Africa, show up with a fucking walkie-talkie and a can opener. And then there's one other piece of Shaft lore, I suppose. Yeah, there's the Samuel L. Jackson. So it was 
up until you know recently i was under the impression it was a remake i think everybody's under that impression but the reality of the film is richard roundtree appears in his award-winning role as john shaft of course he couldn't let a movie he couldn't left any kind. I imagine Richard Roundtree goes to the black exploitation version of Comic Con every year uh-huh. and reprises his. You know, he shows up and signs Shaft autographs. He couldn't let anything go out under the Shaft name without you know getting involved right. himself. But I'm sure they reached out to. I do, sure, who cares absolutely. how it happened? But, but he winds up in Shaft as in John Shaft. One, right. Which upon hearing this, I wonder: Well, is Samuel L. Jackson his twin? Does he get plastic surgery? Are we going to pull up? foxy brown thing here but it turns out that samuel L. jackson plays his nephew and is just a young john shaft so he's even more of a renegade and they can right. set it in modern times and they don't have to betray the black exploitation 70s vibe because it's a modern it's his ancestry right right that is john shaft and no one expects richard roundtree's character of shaft to be anything different than how he was in exactly his, they wouldn't have it any other way mm-hmm. so really we have four movies in the uh, just you know as when we consider a slasher franchise we would consider pseudo remake prequel things mm-hmm. within the franchise i don't think this is a shaft reboot i think it was supposed to be a reboot but so i'm gonna go ahead and say there's four movies in the uh, shaft trilogy yeah in the shaft trilogy thanks gladly enter the dragon is still back in the 70s which uh-huh. by the way was when nudity was still okay yep did you notice this i did just normal movie hanging out happens to be a lot of nudity mm-hmm. thank you the 70s yep now, that's like fashion, right? Where it comes back in waves. That's going to happen sure. again at some yeah, point. Yeah, a wave where... of nudity is just around the corner. <laughs> oh, God, I'm waiting for it. But you know what I mean? In film, where all of a sudden there'll just be a whole decade or hopefully 50 years sure. of cinema where people can just hang out and be naked mm-hmm. and it's not going to be... Extra money, extra ratings. A movie nobody sees that, that's that falls into obscurity because there's nudity in it. Oh, so fucking disappointing. But it's Enter the Dragon and mm-hmm. there's naked people. So, uh, what's going on with black exploitation and kung fu? Because there's okay. a connection here, right? There is, and this the... isn't just an accident, as you would have had me believe that mm-hmm. we keep doing these movies right. together. No, it actually um, the the connection has a name. Mm-hmm. His name is Jim Kelly. And really, this is his first really debut in film. He plays uh, Williams, not to be confused with Willie from the last movie. Exactly, but he was in a bunch of exploitation films in the 70s he was in three the hard way he was in something i think called afro ninja he was in a ton of these kung fu black exploitation he's a martial arts guy right? yeah he that uh, and first and foremost a martial arts guy i think in just about every one of the movies he owns a dojo which is again i don't under i'm not even going to get into martial arts but the thing about jim kelly for me is that he barely qualifies as black exploitation. Mm-hmm. He has the afro, he has the look down, mm. but he the never The sounds too, yeah, always sure. important. I always forget the sounds in these movies. Yeah. The whip snap, what is that meat slapping, whatever yeah. the fuck they do to make those sounds. And then also we have to talk about the Bruce Lee sounds. Yeah, absolutely. Which I how would you describe those? The sound like a surprised chicken. It's a chicken, right? That's what they Oh god. It makes it terrifying. And mm-hmm. when the camera just stays on his expressions and he makes these noises I don't want to use awkward because I used awkward to describe the end of Shaft, and it's not that kind of awkward, uh-huh. but it's another kind of, I'm a, it's like when you're on the train and you catch someone staring at you, right. and you kind of get frozen where you're staring at them and mm-hmm. you, you can't avert your glance. That's what's going on right. with Bruce Lee in this movie. Anyways, you were talking about black well, people. Well, the, basically, the, the thing about Jim Brown, and it's really noticeable in this film, is he has a bunch of those sassy quippy shaft-esque lines where he comes off as the badass cool black guy does he come off as the badass cool black guy he's not shaft his smiles are ingenuine it seems (laughs) like he's almost embarrassed to be the sassy black dude right he kind of it seems like he wants to show up and kick ass right he doesn't want to be the sex symbol that kind of goes hand in hand with being a black exploitation icon. It's weird. I wonder if that's part of his fame or not, part of his infamy. I can't tell if that was just his thing to play the guy who didn't want to play those roles. Mm -hmm. Because uh, for as much of an oddity as that is, you see that pop up. I mean, that's every scene that he plays in the whole movie where he's just somewhere between. It's almost like it's satire of black exploitation. Uh Look at this. This actor who was in an era that fell out and now he's this kind of cast out guy and has to play these roles. 
that's the vibe you get. But this is clearly still in the era yeah, of black sure. exploitation. It's in the heart of, of what's going on. So I guess that would make him Jim Kelly reluctant kung fu black man something like that yeah something like that he's great i love him yeah that's the that's the weird part is that that character is fantastic mm-hmm. that you love watching him not like the yeah, exactly. not like the role he's playing exactly you wouldn't want to see any other type of movie with mm-hmm. him in it that's the fucking role that you're interested in and we go from something uh like that to bruce lee yeah which is completely different as we'll talk about with our tournament blueprint yeah completely different role that happens to come together in this odd collection of people from yeah. around the globe who come together <laughs> who have seemingly nothing in common except right, right. the urge to win well bruce lee in the film is the character whose name is lee mm-hmm. um he's also the character who has about 96 percent of the screen time in the film yeah but bruce lee is the icon of kung fu mm-hmm. now we, it's i mean at the time in the 70s there were no other kung fu icons. It was Bruce Lee or Bust. He was the name. He was the go-to. And now we have Jet Li, Tony Ja, Jackie Chan. I mean, there's there's five or six big kung fu names. But back then, it was Bruce Lee. Even now when there's a decline of kung fu popularity compared yeah. to that time... It's weird that we have so many more, right. uh, so many more names. Well, and the thing, the thing is, is, is I kind of think of it in my head is it's almost a schism where mm-hmm. Bruce Lee was the best there will ever be because he's a great fight choreographer. He does all the fight choreography and Enter the Dragon. Sure, he's a good actor. He's very charismatic. He knows his way around a frame. He's just an all around great kung fu character he's a perfect fit for these exactly and so i feel like now that since he's died almost immediately after this film right Mm -hmm. that there's kind of been a schism in the kung fu school where you get your acting from jackie chan he's got the comedy over here jet lee does all the crazy shit you didn't think people could do tony ja does all the wonderful choreography right but you don't have all of it in one package anymore people have their different specialties exactly So you mentioned something to me as we were watching this about real Kung Fu. Yes. Where do you make that distinction? What is that? Well, I think a lot of real Kung Fu, one, it's got to come from the 70s. Okay. I mean, that's where the Kung Fu thing started. Sure. And I'm not talking David Carradine Kung Fu. No. I'm talking, you know, the Kung Fu from China, whip snapping sounds. Yeah, yeah. And and bad The dubbing. authenticity you're talking about. Sure. And, and it's all the film. It's. Kung Fu to me is a film where the plot is secondary. Yeah. It's, it's kind of like in the eighties when there was the big, I I don't know if you're aware of this, but there was a big advent of stunt films Oh sure. in the early eighties where it was just people crashing cars because it (laughs) looked cool and the plot was absolutely negligible. That's how I feel about what I would call real Kung Fu is you're there to watch some really artistic fighting and the reason the fighting's going on is all well and good, but as long as the plot as long as the plot gives you a reason to fight, you're on board. And Enter the Dragon gets those visuals right. It gets the um just the entire craft of filmmaking around Kung Fu, you know, so spot on. There's uh there's that scene early on with the um you know, where he's doing these incredible moves with the guy who has a scar over his eye. Yes. And there's some super legit slow-mo stuff in there, yeah. especially for the 70s. Absolutely. And it's the kind of thing where if you can almost imagine being in a group full of men, everybody would kind of roar as it went into slow-mo. I'm of the mindset where I would actually flee from that scene. Oh, right. I see people fighting and I'm going to take off and catch it on YouTube later. But there's that one. There's the one uh, in the heroin lab later on, yeah. too. Where uh, when we look back to a lot of the slow-mo stuff in the 70s, it's almost part of the signature of that era. You know, in the same way to talk about things like uh, zoom lenses, dramatic slow zoom and stuff. stuff yeah. yeah, part of the '70s was jerky slow motion. It was not having an adequate frame rate on the day that you shot, and deciding in post or uh, just maybe not having the equipment available for whatever reason. You see these these really jerky slow mo shots. It's something that almost looks like the zombies from Twenty Eight Days Later. Yeah, you know, it just doesn't move naturally. But when they showed up for Enter the Dragon. They had the right fucking machinery. They knew well in advance that they were doing these scenes in slow motion because they wanted that. Well, then that's a kung fu thing, right? Mm -hmm. Slow motion is definitely something that kung fu calls for. It allows you to appreciate what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, the entire art form of kung fu, to look at it as as something more similar to dance than to martial arts. That's why I like like the term fight choreography because that's what it is. It legitimizes it. 
instead of making it that sort of bullshit pseudoscience board breaking nonsense. Yeah, exactly. It becomes, you know, someone sat there with a fucking pencil and paper Mm -hmm. and came up with, uh, you know, kind of like when we talked about equilibrium, about the choreography there, about Kurt Wimmer and his backyard, Uh having to come up with these ideas. How are these going to be done? What were the moves going to look like? Do they look pleasing in front of a camera? Well, and do you buy them? Do you buy that these people are getting hit? And there's the one fight where both of us were questioning whether <laughs> sure. the New Zealander was actually getting Yeah, actually up. getting his ass kicked. And so when it's done well, you have to appreciate that art mm-hmm. form. It's, it's really incredible. There's a lot that goes into it. And slowing it down allows people who can't, you know, inherent in that art form is that you can't really appreciate it if you can't do it. Right. You know, magic's always uh, my fucking go-to for that kind of shit on this show. But if you don't know the behind the scenes of that stuff, it's hard for me to just watch people fighting in real time Mm -hmm. because I don't know anything about choreography in the same way that it's hard for me to watch dance and appreciate and have any idea what's happening. Right. But if you slow it down, I have the time to see the expressions, how the people feel in the moment, how their punches are landing, if that's believable, that component of it, um, how the, the bodies are actually working within the confines of that 16 by 9 or that right. 2, 3, 5 to 1 frame that they're in. And it just gives my mind the time to react, especially when you're dealing with something like fighting, where your internal instinct is to go, oh shit, people are fighting, yeah. and overlook all of that stuff. So the slow motion is perfect for that. But back to that other characteristic you were talking about, mm-hmm. the uh, the thing called plot that has to show up right. in these movies. Yeah. We have the uh, fighting tournament blueprints. Fighting tournament blueprint. Not the first time we've seen that on the show. No, it's definitely not. Uh, DOA was the, the classic example Absolutely. all the way back in the beginning of year one where we saw, I mean, what is this, this fighting blueprint? A, a group of people of the same talent. In this case, they're all fighters. Sure. Uh, who are completely a hodgepodge from all over the globe, Mm -hmm. are chosen as the best in their field, in their region, in their area, and called to a single locale, probably an island, where they will have to spar with each other in order to find out who is the reigning champion. And they all show up with different motivations. They all kind of are familiar with each other. A couple of them are friends from their past, and there's a newbie who wins? Yeah, the newbie always wins. Yeah, there's never any question about who's going to win. It's almost as if that formula begs you to ask which one will win, right? As if that's where the suspense is. But sure. you know who's going to win. Yeah, always you know who's going to win. And the the thing that is always a twist in the tournament blueprint formula is that turns out the whole tournament is the facade of a seedy underbelly sure. in which the tournament is actually fueling what is going to be a very catastrophic event or business. In this case, it's heroin dealing. Oh, I'm sorry. So you mean all these people coming together internationally from around the fucking globe to come fight? That's not just for the amusement, the entertainment of one rich man? No. Fuck, how did I not see this coming? I'm sorry. Did this get too confusing for you? So I want to put out a quick challenge. Uh I think this might be the first fighting tournament blueprint movie. It's possible. And uh, and we wouldn't have any idea. So that's why I'm saying might. I want to just kind of put that out to the people listening to the show. If there is a movie that follows the collection of warriors from around the globe come together to fight for the amusement of one man's seat underbelly thing, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. I would like to know if Enter the Dragon actually came up with that. We're just going to declare it winner by default. Sure. Until someone challenges that. This will be our our tournament blueprint theory, is that it was started. And theories are meant to be proven wrong. Via an internet tournament blueprint. Beautiful. What's pretty amazing about Under the Dragon is that this blueprint has only been done worse. Yeah. I mean, you really don't ever get much better than what Under the Dragon's put together and Mm -hmm. why it's done that. The other movies kind of just steal the exact ideas so that they have their own excuse to do kung fu. I think the only thing anybody has ever added is better roles for women. Yeah. Which that's comes through true. you know, modernization. Or the, cars. Literally the only role for women in this movie is in the brothel. Yep. I mean that's it. There is not one woman in the entire movie. His sister, who Harry carries herself so she doesn't have to get raped. Yeah, you see what I'm talking about? Yeah. The only real female person and not just a fuck puppet commits suicide. Can't deal with it, man. All the men are overwhelming her. It's hard to be a woman, I hear. Yeah, so that sucks, but I'll forgive Enter the Dragon for that. And as these movies go on, you see the badass female figures. Sure. Which isn't, I mean, something that I even want to commend modern movies for, because that's become an archetype in cinema anyways. Sure. Just badass 
you know, Resident Evil fighting woman, whatever. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we're going to add it to the updated blueprint. So there's one other thing I really want to talk about with Enter the Dragon. And that's uh, that I was a little afraid to cover this yeah. movie on the show. Sure. And I mentioned that back when we did the Black Dynamite one, mm -hmm. you know, the the entire idea of movies, double feature, not ready to cover, whatever. And Enter the Dragon, I'd never seen, and it's a big piece of Kung Fu history. Sure. A genre I know little to nothing about. And all the artwork is really kind of Asian influenced. It looks very artistic and completely unapproachable. Yeah, so I'm thinking high art movie, I'm not going to understand. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking hero, really. Yeah, right. Something I'm going to have to really fucking concentrate on and focus. And subtitles and colors. Right, and what we're getting is more akin to Escape from New York. Yeah. This is, uh, thankfully, there's Han in this movie. Right. So Han is the super villain arch nemesis guy. Right. And if anything makes this movie approachable, if there's anything I can say to an audience that hasn't seen this movie yet that convinces them all right, this movie isn't too fucking complicated for me. You have Han with the fake hand. Yes. His name is Han. He has a fake hand. And this is exposed during, I don't even believe I'm saying these words. His fake hand is exposed during the disco fight scene. Right. Okay. So he literally reveals this hand and then it cuts to a scene right afterwards, right after the fake hand, it cuts to a scene of him diabolically petting a white cat Yep. in, I'm not done, a hand museum that he has created with all of his interchangeable hand pieces. Right. It might sound like maybe I'm just making this funnier than it, but it has even less tact than mm -hmm. I am allowing it right now. And we go right from the, the Dr. No petting the kitten scene to kitten decapitation. Right. So I'm thinking we have unapproachable movie, but actually the movie pets a white cat, right? Right. That's how we'll know, hey, you know what? Fucking movie, it's not too hard. Just watch it. It Everybody makes it sound like it's a lot artsier and unapproachable that it is when really there's a Dr. No villain or something where the movie's just, it's, it's a lot it more ridiculous. It pets the white cat. It pets the white cat. Thank you. That's why we need a phrase for it. And that tells you a lot about what kind of movie it is. I feel like there's a lot of people who haven't seen Enter the Dragon. It's, it just gives off this idea other than what it truly is at heart. There's a mm -hmm. lot that people don't know about it. It's, um, I mean, the, the simple concept, first of all, that they've already seen. They've seen everywhere. You told me, all right, don't worry about Enter the Dragon. We've seen DOA. Did you remember DOA? You got DOA. Okay, you got Enter the Dragon. And that's really all it is. It's yep. a pretty simple format. And then it gets heisty a little bit, too. The music, especially, sure. makes it really heisty. It's not really until that final mirror scene that the art gets a little intense. Mm -hmm. But by that time, you know, you're getting a headache watching this. It seems insane and complicated to shoot. Right. But you just have to pull yourself back and remember that as they shot that, it didn't have to make any sense. Right. I'm sure their biggest problem was concealing the camera. You don't actually have to know where the characters are, what angle is bouncing off what, because the whole thing's a fucking illusion. All they have to do is shoot a bunch of people in mirrors. It looks confusing as shit, and no one's going to... It's the, not like someone's lining up the trigonometry right, sure. at home. And the whole premise is that the characters are confused themselves. Exactly, exactly. So you're just pointing mirrors in a lot of directions and making people confused. How perfect of a fucking ending metaphor for what this film Absolutely. is. Absolutely. So that's an odd thing to talk about the first piece of Bruce Lee's career, because while he was doing dubbing for this movie, that's when he died. Mm -hmm. He kind of... Uh, he had these collapses, I guess, these kind of headaches or seizures... And one day he went to bed and didn't wake up. And it's, it's weird because I'm trying to figure out, all right, this is either the first thing or the last thing Bruce right. Lee has ever done. And if you find out what movies he's been in, that doesn't really help explain that at yeah, all. Yeah, not at all. Because there's, there's a Bruce Lee movie that came out in 78, mm -hmm. you know, seven years after his death. Um, this is only one of the, the big three movies he's considered famous for. Right. And so I think uh, this is definitely one of those guys, at the very least, you could say he died well before his time. Absolutely. Um, I, everybody dies well before mm -hmm. their fucking time. But he accomplished something big, and before even really getting the recognition for it, before being able to go on and do all these other things, you know, he could have had a 50... I mean, look at David Carradine. David yeah. Carradine, since Kung Fu, sure. has gone on to do a lot of stuff, most of which we talk about on the, the show all the time. Yeah. That same kind of length of career could have, uh, could have been Bruce Lee's as well. Tell me the website, motherfuck. Oh, the website is doublefeatureshow.com. You can enter the tournament of tournament blueprints awesome. by sending us an email to doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. 
You can donate to us by going to donate.doublefeatureshow.com. Turns out some of those people might actually pick the movies we're doing at the end of the year. That's impressive. Listen to any other show we've yeah. ever done to hear about that. And uh, what I guess we're doing two more next time? Of course we're doing two more next time. So um warning people up front, they're shit movies. They're awful fucking movies. You're giving me the raised brow. Are you ready? We're going to do The Room and The Happening. Oh, what a good fucking time. So I've never said that about two movies we've uh-huh. ever paired before. But I mean, The Room is laughable. Ha ha. Good. You'll have a good time. And The Happening is just offensive in how goddamn awful it is. But there's a question to get to there, yep. which, if you can read into that sentence a little bit, has maybe already presented itself. <laughs> Watch more fucking film. Or don't. Bye.